All right. Um, so, so what we're going to do today is we're going to take the next hour and uh, we're going to work with this group to go through a problem solving process to see what we can do to address financial stability for, for military spouses. So uh, today, um, I'm Josh Wagner. I'll be hosting hosting this session. I'm with the Arizona Government Transformation Office. And with us are uh, Ayla Linder, Sonia Vasquez, and Jeremy Monty Montgomery. Do you guys just mind introducing yourselves really quick? Sure, yeah, my name is Ayla Linder, as just implied. I'm the program manager for um, Arizona Coalition for Military Families, specifically within the career navigation and the employer engagement. Um, programs, and I'm super excited to have such a great audience today um, in this solution session. Sonia? Yes, my name is Sonia Vasquez. I am the Employee Engagement Coordinator, the Skill Bridge Coordinator, and the Military Spouse Lead for the Arizona Coalition for Military Families. And yes, like Ayla said, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Hey everybody, I'm Monty. I am Sonia's bearded partner in Mill Spouse Mondays, and uh, I am also a business developer with Fusion Cell. We uh, try to bridge the gap from veteran military spouse, vet spouse, and transitioning service members from where they are to meaningful employment. So that's what we do. I'm here because Sony's crazy enough to invite me. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, uh, Monty. Monty, is it? Yes, sir. Perfect. All right, excellent. And th thank you all for 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 coming. I I have to say I learned a tremendous amount in this last session. Um, I. Personally, I had no idea that over a career, there's on average six to seven serious transitions. Like that, that that's a lot of that's a lot of churn that you're trying to deal with when when any family organization is trying to work towards stability. So um, this is obviously a problem that's worth discussing. There's a lot of people that care significantly about this. We have over 30 people in this room right now that are preparing to contribute to this. So again, thank you for everybody um, for coming. This should be a, a value added session. And um, uh, Sonia, could you, in a second, I'd like to, for, for anyone who didn't attend the first session, I'd, I would like to just provide a couple minutes overview of, again, just what the, the general problem and, and some of the stuff that we're trying to look at here. Um, as part of a structured problem solving session, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at the problem, the, the problem that we're trying to address, and then we're going to go through a couple iterations of getting feedback from this team. Um, first, what what are some of the root causes? We don't want to, you, you never just want to treat the symptoms of an issue, right? You want to treat the, the causes. So by taking some time and investigating why we have this financial stability or the lack of these, these um, high paying jobs is going to help us figure out what we can do about it. So uh, we're, we're first going to start with looking at some root cause analysis, and then we're going to ask the team here to brainstorm and start coming up with ideas of how we can address some of those root causes. Once we can coalesce around a few of those solutions, we'll take the last step, which is, well, what steps can we take to make this a reality? Who do we need to get involved? What do they need to do? What can I do personally to make this, um, to make, to, to work towards solving this larger problem? So. To get started, I just want to make sure that we have context for everybody around what we're doing today. So the today's problem focus, there is a high degree of financial instability due to a lack of advanced placement, portable career opportunities for military spouses while their spouse is stationed in Arizona. Um, so the, the challenge isn't that there's financial instability, which again is, is a, a symptom, but what we really want to focus on today is why is there a lack of advanced placement, portable career opportunities, and what can we do about that? Um, Sonia, do you mind just taking a couple minutes and providing a, a bit of background around this before we get started? Absolutely. I'll go ahead and start with um, giving a little background about myself, right? I am a military spouse. My husband has been in for the past 19 years. Um, I've transitioned not only to different places, different installations, but in different career fields, right? But I I think the main part of this is the fact that you don't know where to where to start, right? Whenever you go into you go into a new location, a new installation, you're brand new. You don't know anybody. You don't know what resources are out there. You don't know where to go or how to even reach for help. So you're only given the resources that your spouse actually brings to you from them going to work. You don't know anybody. So 
I think one of the big things that it's really important is really educating the service members and making sure that they bring that information to their spouses too, like resources, like they connect it, right? Because those kinds of resources really help the entire family as a whole. And it's important for us military spouses to feel that there are organizations out there that actually provide assistance and help to us. Also, it's that fear of starting all over again, that fear of where do I go? I have a lot of different gaps in my, in my, in my resume, or I don't know how to actually implement this, this skill into my resume to reflect the new field that now I'm actually trying to, to acquire. So it's, it's a lot of different factors, but I think that moving from place to place, not being able to build a career or a, a an opportunity to bring with you, it's really, it's really a gap or a barrier for us. Uh, one of the big things for me was to build a career that I'm able to bring with me and grow within, grow with me. And, I, and that way, I don't have to start all over again. I don't have to say, okay, well, now I move to this place, what's available? Let me just work on anything. And a lot of the times you see spouses actually with a lot of experience, a lot of degrees that they don't even know where to turn. They just go and get the first thing that is offered to them. So that's where the, the instability in, in, in the placement is, right? You have lawyers working, nothing, nothing wrong with working in retail or anything, but that's not the field that they actually went to school for, right? But they don't have another option. They don't have another choice. They don't know anything else. So educating yourself, making sure that you, you do the research that your spouse brings that those organizations or that information home is really important, is key for those spouses to actually be successful. And for us to actually really be able to, to reach to those spouses and offer the assistance is important too. Thank you, Sonia. That, that's, that's really helpful. And judging by the comments in the last session, there, there are a ton of knowledgeable people here. Um, and there's a lot of people eager to help figure this out. So um, I'm, I'm really expecting some, some good value out of this. Uh, real quick house cleaning um, for, for the process today. Um, we're going to be using this virtual whiteboard that you see on the shared screen. And I'll be, we'll be documenting all of the feedback as we, as we go through the session today. Um, the primary way that we'd like you guys to engage is through the, through the, the chat feature. Um, as we put questions up and, and we ask for feedback, anything that you guys put into the chat, we're going to transcribe over to the board so we can start collecting everything on this visual board and start talking through and dialoguing around it. Um, that being said, there are over 30 people in the room and slowly ticking up. Um, I can't promise that we're going to get everybody's feedback into the conversation right now. That being said, everything that you guys put into the chat is going to be captured and it's going to be reported out on. So even if we don't focus the conversation around the ideas that you're bringing to the table, please don't feel that they're being disregarded. Um, all of this is going to get follow up. We're just trying to make sure we can focus on some of the, the higher visibility ones while we have everybody together. So um, uh, as we go through again, just use the chat for your primary uh, way of, of communicating and we'll take all of that information and put it over to the board. Um, for our, our speakers today, uh, once we start getting some feedback from everybody, um, it would be great to get if you guys have any insight, um, any, any ancillary anecdotes that we wanna talk through, um, again, just to flush out the entire picture of what we're trying to do. So for these three sessions, the way it's going to work is we're going to break these into 15 minute blocks. So 15 minutes on root cause, 15 minutes on solutions, and then 15 minutes focused on um, action, actioning those solution ideas. So for the first 15 minutes, we are going to be focused on one question specifically. And that question is why? Whenever you talk about treating the the cause versus the symptoms, it's always important to make sure that you're going after the right problem and at the right level. By, by bringing this in front of the team and starting to think through why this is an issue, it's gonna allow us to really focus in on those root causes to make sure that we're solving this at the, at the root rather than the symptoms that we see down the chain. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put a 15 minute timer on the board and over this next 15 minutes, I'd like you guys just to take maybe five or 10 at first, 
to start thinking through why why you're not able to to land in a new state and immediately uh, jump into a similar role. Um, and that could be because of the lack of resources available. It could be related to the, you know, the, the available jobs in the ecosystem that you're working in. But we want to try to flush this out. So uh, without giving you guys any more answers, because we don't want to cheat, <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and start a 15 minute timer. And you guys, please start entering your information in the chat. And as soon as we start getting enough content on the board, we'll organize it and we'll start talking through it. Again, if you guys have any questions, uh, put it in the chat. We'll be sure to follow up and we'll uh, we'll see how this plays out. So I'm going to put a timer on and I'm going to give everyone a few minutes to think this through and stop talking personally. And it looks like people are already contributing. Lots of things, awesome things coming in. So great. I love the amount of feedback we're already seeing in the chat. I, I appreciate the level of engagement with you guys. Thank you so much. As we get more on here, I'm going to start going through and um, I want to start bucketing some of these, figuring out which ones are related under a general topic. So uh, Sonia, a Ayla, um, Monty, if you guys see general themes um, coming out, let me know and we can start grouping them around um, just to, to keep the conversation focused. You got it. Thank you so much. There's, there's definitely a lot that I'm seeing in here specifically around uh, job availability, um, either for the logistics of where the bases are or the, the entry requirements. So rule at limited advancement placement opportunities. Let me go ahead and I'm gonna pull these into a section so we can start grouping some of these. And I apologize. I know this is small for a, a lot of people. Oh, for anybody, um, I'm going to provide a slight deviation. If anybody would like to look at the board directly, and you don't have to, you're welcome to use the, the screen share. But this board is available um, publicly for anybody to view. So if you want to be able to go to the board and look at it, I'm going to go ahead and drop that in the chat. It's not a requirement. Um, I'll, I'll zoom in on these sections as we're talking about them as well. Okay, companies located uh, location, a lot of location. Flexible short-term assignments. So the length of the assignments. Um, We see a lot of either skill gaps or skill misalignment. Um, sometimes that's talking about the, the available certifications for some of these higher profile jobs. And a lot of these are tied to timing. So um, the a length of time. So we'll start pulling some of those together. 
length of time. Skill gaps, certifications, yep. Yeah. There's a lot of great input. Okay. So this is tied to experience. Again, available experience or experience misalignment. All right, I may start pulling some of these to a new area. Apologize, it'll get cleaner. And gap explanation, nowhere to start looking. Okay. So uh, Janine, as you're putting these on, um, there are additional post-its on the side. I'm just gonna clear these out so we got a bit of room to work. Okay, so a couple topics, reoccurring topics we're seeing right off the bat is the skill alignment, um, whether it's misalignment, lack of skills, or skills that don't transfer. Um, I think there's there's quite a bit of feedback around this. And if you guys can think of better topic headers, just let me know. I'm happy to happy to adjust anything. Uh, or non transferable. And then we have duration of deployment. Looks like another topic. Uh, military spouses are not in one spot for too long. Employers are concerned to hire because it's not necessarily a long-term position. Then we have another grouping over here. Thanks, Janine, for helping to pull that together. Uh, child care flexible schedules. So for staying at home moms, uh, people who want uh, remote work aspects, um, people with, with children who need that additional support if there's not remote options available, lack of flexible schedules. I know um, we, we, are, we are looking at right now, um, you guys mentioned the SkillBridge candidates um, from DOD. I think uh, state of Arizona is actually looking to take advantage of that program. And one of the aspects of it is um, the need to work around their current deployment, right? Around their current activities. So that for, for some, there can definitely be barriers, right? If, if, it's, if you're not, if it's not the, the, the first priority or, or the, the main focus. Skills are misaligned. I'm going to put all of the skills together right now. So I've always done it as a bad thing. Employer schedule and it is an issue. Flexible schedules. All right, we got about half the time through. There's a starting to die down on the feedback. So we'll just work through the rest of these organizations. So childcare flexible schedules. So the ability to actually go to work uh, based on the, the requirements you have. Um, having the skills um, either be misaligned, uh, not appropriate, or the required credentials not transferable. Um, Duration of deployment, the amount of time someone's actually going to be available to commit to developing that within that job and role. Sonia, Ayla, Monty, are these are these co pretty common uh, root causes that you guys are seeing? They are. They really are. And um, a little bit about like what Monty and I do. Um, with our Mill Spouse Monday project is we actually get this military spouses to share with us different struggles and barriers that they have, whether they're looking for a new, a new career um, field or looking for connections, right? And a lot of what is here is something that was shared to us, right, Monty? Through this military spouses in this community. 
Yeah, I think quite honestly, the, the, the main root cause, Josh, is sitting with the old guard doing the hiring of this new employment force, right? We have traditional HR experiences, traditional HR processes that are outdated, inundated, not, not efficient, and definitely not good for our community. So when you look at root causes, we have legislation, legislation issues. We've got certifications that are not crossing state lines. We have um, uh, licenses that aren't, aren't crossing state lines. There are so many root causes at many different levels. And I think this post-COVID world, we need to massively take advantage of us, of this situation as employers to realize that this remote environment will massively impact th this community. Um, we, we have a situation where every single military spouse is handed the same basket of problems every time their, their, their service member is notified of any kind of transition. This is not new, it's, it's frustrating. And, and it, it's wildly um, assuming to think that it's going to be okay without doing something and without making some noise. So I love this. Everything that's popping up on these, on these sticky notes, I must have typed up 20 myself, and none of them really came from my brain. This is what has been shared with Sony and I throughout this Mill Spouse Mondays experience. The root causes literally lie in a couple areas, in my opinion, legislation, hiring practices, and the inability of a military spouse to effectively market themselves. Mm -hmm. Those three areas to me, if we could address those three areas, even a little bit every single day, we're making a massive impact. No, that, that's great. That's great input, Monty. Um, do we want to, so relying on the subject matter experts in the room, th this, uh, this is rather new for me. Um, are these the root cause, the, what we have up here right now, as far as the categories, are these the ones that we want to take into this next, uh, this next round? Or Mani, do we want to focus on any of the other ones um, that, that you're calling out as well? Like, do we want to make sure that we have something focused on, for instance, legislation? Um, should we maybe change the lack of opportunity awareness to more of a, a marketing focus, right? So it's, it's real, more about getting yourself out there. I, I wanna make sure that we're setting ourselves up so that when we're brainstorming for solutions, we're focusing the solutions around the real problems that we need to address. So I would love your guys' input just to make sure that we're gonna be focusing this next round on the right topics. Well, I like your lack of opportunity awareness because quite honestly, I think that can be stripped right down into networking and marketing yourself. Um, the way that you phrase that I, I think is telling in a lot of different ways, but it's also telling on the employer side of the house, the human resources side of the house, the people needing the talent, they've got a lack of opportunity awareness of what this talent pool is available to them, you know, what they can do. So I, I love that one. The legislation piece I think is, is a short topic and may not be high value here other than the fact that people need to be wildly aware of how they vote and they need to make sure that, that these kind of things are making the agendas, they're making the bills, that they're being talked about in their state offices um, and make some noise and join organizations like the United States Military Chamber Spouse, Military Chamber Spouse, however they, they phrase that, but joining organizations that can force multiply your message. So maybe on the legislation side, that's something that, that our listeners can take away from. Um, th that's a couple areas that, that uh, I got comments on anyway. No, I really appreciate that, Monty. And, and when we talk about solutions, um, legislation is absolutely a, a, a path. So um, if uh, identifying ways that we can engage and, and build some of these into law or statute, um, develop policies to, to support the, the people, I think that that still might come up in the next sec section, even if we're not specifically focused on it. Okay, um, so looks like we have uh, all of the feedback from the group, we, I think we have some really strong categories here and it sounds like we're in alignment. So great job. This is a, a ton of great input. And again, remember if we don't address things specifically, we are going to be reporting out on all of this, um, moving forward. So I'm going to go ahead and move us on to the next stage. And what we're going to do now is we're going to take these primary topic themes that we've identified. And we're gonna start figuring out what can we do to solve these? What can we do to make an impact? Um, and when I say we, I don't, I, I don't mean collectively, I mean, what can the state do? What, what can the federal government do? Uh, what can citizens do? What can private industry do? I wanna try to understand from all aspects, what, uh, 
let's let's just talk about tangible ideas and we'll we'll run through the same process and we'll see what we can coalesce around before we actually figure out how we want to action these and what we're going to be able to uh what we're going to be able to take away from this so for this next session uh the next the next round now we're going to move on from focusing on the why to now that we've identified some of these root causes what 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 can we do about it right so this is a great opportunity now to just start brainstorming what can we do um, to improve our lack of opportunity awareness, right? What can we do to make sure that there are more positions open that are in alignment with the skills that we're trying to bring? And I see we, we already got some suggestions coming in, which is absolutely great. So we got hey, another- Josh, I want to I wanna throw up a term for everybody's consideration. Um, what I'm learning throughout this process with Sony and the Mill Spouse Mondays thing is that we need to, we need to, equally coin the phrase vet spouse as much as we do mill spouse. Um, almost immediately when the service member leaves the service, we, we put ourselves in a situation where they get into this veteran spouse status and the amount of resources diminishes by almost 66%. Two third of all available resources are gone. Problems are the same, issues the same. In fact, they've even compounded worse because now you've had a, a career uh, uh, taking care of your, your, your service member and nothing to, to, to really help you with that. So I would love for this community to continue to champion the phrase vet spouse every time they say mill spouse, or at the very least have an understanding of the need. Yeah, that, that's an unfortunate that there's disparity um, be, between the two statuses. And, and I, I would imagine that makes it more difficult to have conversations uh, because you need to specifically focus in on, on one or the other. Um, okay, a lot, lot of feedback still coming in. So uh, again, we're going to take this time, we're, we're just focus on brainstorming how we can, uh, some solutions that we can bring to specifically deal with these five topics that we've identified. Josh or Ayla or Sonia, can you help me understand who's in the audience? Like who is listening? What, what is our makeup? Yeah, thanks Monty for that. And it appears as if we've got a pretty good mix. Um, we've got some military spouses and veteran spouses. Um, we do have some veterans as well as um, the employers um, from state as well as uh, federal, we got state. We've also got other organization representatives uh, at multiple levels, federal, state and local city, county. And then there's a nice mix of, it appears as if veteran and military spouses. So quite the, quite the handful today. So when we talk about this lack of opportunity awareness and you give me that scope of people that are involved with this, that's crazy to think that in your, in, in your small region that that should be a problem anymore. Mm -hmm. So the legislators, the companies, the, the, the um, veteran spouses, military spouses, and I'd love to talk to the service member directly we need to make sure that this opportunity is just explored and exploited and pushed out everywhere. How can this be a, a topic that we have to spend much time on? Lack of opportunity awareness. That, that is probably one of the saddest ones that we could have in terms of a root cause problem. We should want to be able to find a way, companies as well, to blow these opportunities out as far as they can. And it is, it is just, to me, I think it's a lack of opportunity opportunity awareness on the employer side. If they knew there was a talent pool like this that they could market directly to, they would. It benefits their bottom line. So for the employers that are out there, I, I just really encourage you to familiarize yourself with what a military spouse is, what they bring to the table. You're looking at, I'll use my wife as an example, master's degree in public health, two bachelor's degree, an associate's degree, 10-year uh, veteran as well. And then she takes this large gap to, to raise this family. And here's a woman that is just wildly capable, um, excited to re-enter, and there is a massive amount of misalignment in how to evaluate her return on the investment for your company. Why? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and it happens more often than we like to admit, right? That, that gap, and it's sometimes this fear of starting all over, and sometimes we don't even try, right? Like, as military spouses, sometimes we're just so tired to 
to be turned down that that is just we just somehow lost hope or or we just think that people are not going to understand that gap or understand the skills or th that, that that aspect right there is just really unfortunate and also the lack of I think it's really important for us, for the military, the military, right? Like our service members here to really understand that it's important to bring that information home, to communicate that because whenever they move to a different city, a different installation, and they have to start all over again, they depend on your the information that you're bringing home in order for them to succeed and to start all over again, right? And the, the, the point is for them not to start all over again, right? So that's where the, the employment availability and that flexibility comes into play. Um, it's important for employers to really understand the benefits of actually retaining that military spouse within your organization by offering those opportunities, whether it is remote or not. Remote, it would be beneficial, right? Because you're able to bring with them or something transferable to a different place or a different point of contact somewhere else. I know sometimes they, you know, it's, it's a lot easier said than done, but um, those remote opportunities, I think, will definitely benefit our military spouse community for sure. Sonia, I'd like to hear too about what what would it do? What kind of for the employers in the room or those who are in workforce development, um, learning for those who are not veterans in attendance or for those who are in attendance and are veterans, how can they get them um, to attend navigator training? Um, would be connected and you know really how how can the employers learn about what the military spouse is going through and the veteran spouses are going through um, in that struggle of deployments, TDYs, and you know, the culture. Um, so just talk about you know, why that's important, why that you tell every employer partner to attend that navigator training and how that can help them understand it without having them spend years and years in the service like the military spouses do. Absolutely. Well, it's it's not only important to really understand the military culture itself, right? It's really under, it's really important to really understand the, the language of a service member of the military, but also important to really understand the, the, the importance of those gaps, right? Or importance of that volunteer work that that, that that military spouse did throughout that gap, that career gap. And I think a lot of this gap comes into play with childcare, right? Which is another factor that we have here. Childcare is a huge issue within the military community and especially for those military spouses to actually be able to take advantage of those opportunities. And that is why it's important to, for installations, for the government to really implement different ways to help the spouses and the childcare within their community. My issue, for example, I, I was lucky now, I'm so blessed to have to be here with Be Connect and the Arizona Coalition where I'm able to work from home. I have a remote opportunity that I started in Arizona and now I'm all the way in Fort Meade, Maryland. And I was able and lucky enough to, thank you so much, to bring my opportunity with me and still serve our military community. But um, one struggle that I have is my son has been in the waiting list for since I got here, since November. And there's no light in, in, at the end of the tunnel, right? Like we don't know when he's going to have availability within childcare, which is to me ridiculous being such a big city, right? There's no childcare inside or out. So that's a huge struggle also for military spouses. And we rely on the neighbor, on the, the friend that's able to watch our, our child. But then what happens when that person is sick? Then we have to call, call, uh, call out. We have to we have to miss work. And then sometimes those employers don't understand. I had a, a military spouse that actually confided in me and she, she explained to me that she had to leave her, her job opportunity because her employer did not understand that she had to, to not have the video open. And she was working remotely, had the video uh, on because she was breastfeeding her child and her spouse was deployed. So she couldn't even, she didn't even have help with her spouse or with someone else that were new to the area. She had to work, she was working from home, but the employer didn't understand. So educating yourself on not just military spouse, not just the military culture, but just like as a human being, right? Like under, be, be that, understand that there are those struggles, not only in the military spouse community, but also females, also as a mother, like parents, especially right now where it's really expensive to just one person in the household to have 
a job. Like so right now, a lot of people have to go for those both, both parents to actually work. And it's a struggle right now in our community. And Monty too, I think this is a great point in regards to HR and the pandemic and being a mom myself, a veteran myself, I would never have been able to make it as a military spouse. I say that right now, I would have figured it out. So I always say hats off to Sonia for what she's doing, what she continues to do for her family and hats off to your, to your spouse, Jeremy. But Jeremy, I would love to hear more about what we can do right now while we are still brainstorming and moving things around on the whiteboard about taking advantage of, as Sonia had said, the HR, the orthodoxies, all the things that pandemic has shown our employers and how can we support spouses, predominantly the females of the partnership, if they do have a child and they are caring for them at home. It's not enough to say, yes, we have remote opportunities. It's not because first of all, they're usually very entry level, right? Um, so right there, one, I would like to hear what your thoughts are on that too. What can HR do? What can businesses do? to support the spouses, primarily the females, in this creating a new way that's, it's a long-term, it's a change in the foundation of an organization. This is the way they're going to do it from now on. It's not just because of the pandemic. I see a lot of companies right now, they have a financial stipend or a uh, salary increase, right? We also see all types of things to support folks when they're working remotely. And we also hear in conference uh, calls that, a lot of employers are going back, they're forcing their, their employees to go back to the office. So how can we take advantage from your perspective um, to tell other employers in the room that this needs to be something that we put into the foundation and we take advantage of this because this can benefit veteran spouses and military spouses. So I would like, love to hear your thoughts from an employer perspective to the employers in the room, how we can make this uh, a permanent fixture of our organization, so offer employment. Well, silly as it sounds, I call this toddler time. And that's, that's simply by asking the question, why? So why can't this role be remote? A four-year-old would ask that. Why can't I go outside? Why can't I play here? So to the employers out there, really get down to the brass tacks of why this person needs to be in your office. What, what's the point? Um, are, are, we, are we passing papers and notes? We're not doing that anymore. Um, now, there are some positions, there are some roles, there's some engineering level firms, there's some things that you just can't do remotely. That's not what we're talking about. So I, I think it's important to go to toddler time and just simply peel that onion until you get to the tears. Like, why can't we do this? Why wouldn't this work? How can we make it work? Um, that part is important. We need to take a completely different look at it. The other piece too is you have money available. If your brick and mortar footprint can shrink, you know, and all the bills that come with that, you have more money to play with. We have the ability to move that over instead of throwing that into the profit margin category, throw that into the longevity of building families and, and, and good platforms and giving military and veteran spouses a solid, meaningful, well-paid role that is gonna give you the return on the investment. I think when we look at it from our advocacy side, Sonia, one thing we can never forget is these companies have a need for a return on the investment for whoever they hire. So we, we can't get so soft to the fact that, that we want everybody else to bend to this mold. We have to understand that we must provide a value. And so it's that communication of letting them know what these people are capable of. What a military spouse can do in two hours wearing 65 different hats is probably going to outpace what your office worker can do in eight hours. Guaranteed, have no problem explaining that. Once you understand and embrace what these women and men are capable of doing, you, you almost start to kick yourself, why didn't I do this sooner? So toddler time really means to me is going to that really simple three letter word, which is why, why can't this be remote? Why can't this be hybrid? Why can't I pay them more? All of these little simple questions. Um, the other piece to this too is we need to recreate the evaluation from the human resources level on what it means to, to, to write a position description. So why is this position description written the way that it is? Does this really give us the return on the investment? Are these people really doing the tasks that they're doing? Um, my whole world is, is, is in the employment piece in a lot of different areas. And I will tell you that if you were to read the position description, regardless of who wrote it, and then you talk to the person actually feeling the pain by the absence of that person in that role, that description would not match the one that was written and advertised out there. So there are some solution-based pieces there that I think we can go through and learn from our three-year-olds and just simply ask, well, why not? 
Monty, I'm just going to jump in real quick and say, I really appreciate your passion. You can, I, you can tell very easily that you're, you're very invested in all of this. So uh, just thanks for, thanks for the energy that you bring. Well, hopefully it's not off-putting to, to too many. <laughs> no, this is exciting. Like, the, the opportunity to do something is always exciting and it's empowering. So um, again, I just, I appreciate all your guys' feedback and, and the dialogue. I, th I feel like this is super, super valuable. So we're, we're about to move on to the next section. Um, so real, before we do, um, it looks like really we've fallen into four primary areas. Um, it's, it's all about what opportunities are available and uh, the, the flexibility of those opportunities for, for the requirements and restrictions of being a mill vet spouse. Um, family child care support options, ensuring that uh, we have the safe support that we need so that we can we can get to work. Um, we only had one under this, but I feel it's still actioning not just what can the military do, but what can we do at the local level is probably an area that we want to be able to focus on in the solutioning. And then um, a, a ton around education for military and vet spouses, advocacy programs, um, all of the support structures, and a lot of these uh, we, I, I heard mention of in, in the first um, the first session as well. I, I still don't know what TAPS mean, but I know it's extremely important for making sure that people are, are getting on the right track to, to addressing this. Sonia, you want to fill me in on that acronym? The Transition Assistance Program. So it is the program that helps our service members transition out of the military into successful careers. Awesome. Now, the, the, the Transition Assistance Program also, uh, also serves our military spouse community as well. So military spouses are encouraged to also attend TAP while their, uh, their service members are transitioning out and going through that process as well. Thanks, Sonia. You're very welcome. Okay, so um, we are going to now move on to the third and final feedback loop. And this one is going to be all about actions. What can we do based on all of the things we've identified to actually make this happen? So um, I'm gonna take these four primary topics and for some of these, um, for the people in the room, you might be putting the same things in again because there's a lot of great solutions identified on this, on this page right here. So if you don't mind, let's go ahead and just get a little bit more structure around them. Oops, pull those down, organize them. And we're gonna go right on to question three. And this is really about action. What can we do to get the people in the room uh, and moving all on the same bus, moving towards the, the goals that we have? So uh, we're going we're gonna to reset the timer one more time. And again, I really appreciate everybody's engagement, all of the feedback that we're seeing. And what we want to do now is just ask you, like, this is, this is where the, the rubber meets the road. What do we need to do to make these happen? What do we need to do to improve these? So if, if you had ideas in the last round, please bring them back up. Um, let's start populating all of the different things that we, that we feel we can take as far as actions. The one thing I'll ask is that if you notice, it is a, it is a twofer question. If you know who's responsible or who needs to be responsible for those actions, include them as well. Let's go ahead and call them out and say, hey, we need your help. And, and again, we're gonna be able to take all of this, we're gonna develop some reporting. So all of this feedback is gonna be able to go to leadership um, as they figure out from a strategic standpoint how we can implement. Uh, so the timer's going. Um, so feel free to, to start dropping in some of the ideas on things that we'd like to see to change from the current state to what we want this to be looking like. So Monty, are you, are you suggesting for these solution groups, we, we bucket them under those four categories or provide those four categories so we could uh, use those to just organize? No, I don't wanna make that suggestion. Really my point there is, is I feel like there are three, there are four groups that are responsible to take action. 
Um, and I, I really feel like the service member themselves is number one. This person needs to understand that struggle. I sucked at that. I was terrible at it for many, many years of, of what my spouse might have been going through and just now becoming mature enough to understand that. So I really think if you get to the very root of this, it's that service member, significant other, the service, the person that's serving um, and then has the other person at home. That is where it all begins because that is where all the information is funneled. That is where all the opportunities are funneled. That's where all the awareness is. Now too often the service member is just singularly focused while on mission. Of course they're family oriented. Of course they're thinking about their family. Of course they want to take care of them, but we can do better. Um, and so that, that's my point with those, those four topics. And I think the way that I just described that could carry down in similar fashion to the other three. Got it. So if we're, when we're talking about solutions, this is really how we want to frame it is um, who's, who, who's accountable for, for getting this done. And, and a lot of that comes on the individual person to take advantage of even the resources available, right? We, there's a lot of proactivity that needs to happen around this. All right, solutions are coming in. This one's a little harder. Um, getting to specifics is sometimes a bit more challenging. So again, just to take as much time as you need, um, we'll, we'll keep the ideation going. Can someone tell me about the AZ Veterans Supportive Campus Vet Centers? Is anyone aware of that? Yeah, Nate, if you can unmute Jessica Rosa, please. Sorry to put you on the spot, Jessica. Love to hear more. Hello. Um, I wasn't planning on talking, but <laughs> um, basically, the Arizona Veterans Supportive Campus program is. Um, a group of schools um, in Arizona that have gone through the process to earn a designation. Um, so their employees have undergone training, they have vet centers, they do um, supportive events and programs on their campus. Um, so that's a state legislative program. Um, and we have just under 40 schools that in Arizona that have gone through that. So I think um, that comment about collaborating on um, with the schools and us, um, ADVS and ACMF on on how to how to work through that is is a great idea. Thanks, Jessica. That's super helpful. In state government, we we see all the time. We have a lot of agencies that have similar functions or similar missions that uh, could powers combined could be greater than the individual pieces. But uh, a lot of times we're so focused internally on our own processes and support that we, we forget about that outreach to bring all of the stakeholders together to solve the problem. Um, we see that in government often, you know, talk, talking through like the silo, the silo discussion. Um, and it, it sounds like from between veteran services, um, the, the school perspective, it's, it sounds like there's um, a lot of people that need to get brought to the table, um, just again, to make sure that that every, all of the resources at every level are aligned. So when it comes to available flexible employment opportunities, um, as an employer, the state of Arizona um, also had to deal with the pandemic um, quite significantly, and over half of our workforce ended up migrating to uh, to remote or partially remote uh, positions. So for the state of Arizona, that was a, a huge transformational effort that basically took 16,000, which is about half of our overall population, um, out of the workplace in the office and again into those the virtual office environment. I'm, I'm just thinking what, what can be done from an employer side to make those available and how can we spur that change?
Say that again, the last part. I'm sorry? Can you say that again, the last part? How can we? Yeah, um, just uh, thinking through from the employer side, what, what can we do to action so that we can increase the amount of opportunities available that are remote or hybrid or flexible? Um, I, it's it's very doable, right? From the state of Arizona, we, we were able to, to bring in some significant transformation. So I just, I wonder what the impetus is for employers that we could, you know, what what's the lever that we could pull that would that would drive towards more of those options being available? Josh, a couple examples I, I would give. Um, at Fusion Cell, we were hearing that there was an issue for people to get skill bridge when they were overseas. Um, and when we really asked toddler time, why is that a problem? Well, because there's a time difference. Well, so what? What's, what else is the issue? Oh, there's nothing. Cool. So we hired the first overseas skill bridge person literally on that kind of conversation. Um, so th they're, they're six hours removed from us. And it really came down to, to simply asking, does the accommodations needed to access this talent pool affect our bottom line at all? Can we do this? And can we provide this? It's not a service. You're not doing anybody a favor. You're asking for qualified, ready to go talent. We're not asking you to hire these folks that aren't qualified, but really ask yourself, can we make accommodations in this environment and still meet our bottom line? Can this person contribute effectively? And more often than not, when going through this exercise with many, many companies, large and small, the answer is yes, we can make those accommodations. We can do it. And what's holding them back is it's just not traditional. It just doesn't feel right to have a contract administrator not sitting next door where I can just go grab them right away. Well, that is legacy style leadership. We have to be able to evolve and, and mold into this, this new environment. Now, again, I'm not ignorant to the fact of what it feels like to be an employer and have to make accommodations for a particular talent pool. However, if you still have the need for talent and you haven't found them yet, whoa, this is where we can make some serious headway by asking some real simple questions. Why can't we do this? So Josh, to answer your question, I think employers directly can take a look at the holes that they're trying to fill. Most of them would even be here looking for talent or, or exposing themselves to this kind of information if they didn't have a need. It's just not profitable. Um, some of them will have a very service-oriented heart. This means something to them. Maybe they're a military spouse or veteran spouse or service member that's now in with a company and they want to develop a program with that. I'm not discounting that, that, that process or mindset at all. But why can't we accommodate this talent pool if you're still looking for talent? Thanks, Monty. That's, that's super insightful. So as a as a hiring employer myself, I would have to say that expressing my own ignorance, this isn't something that like that I think about from like when I'm hiring in a, a candidate pool, there there are definitely accommodations that can make that don't just detract from the bottom line or the value or you know, but as an employer, I'm I'm not aware of of what those accommodations need to be. I, I, I don't know a lot of detail around how to even engage to ensure that I'm providing uh, a, a friendly, you know, hi hiring environment. So it, it sounds like even from the employer awareness side um, that just promoting that these opportunities are available, that it's not a, a huge lift and these are maybe some of the considerations that just need to be addressed. That 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 might go a long way, um, because again, like I, it's not it's not a focus I've ever really had. But it it that doesn't mean it it, it can't be without detracting from it whatsoever. That George, tiny you have piece to of add communication to was I'm huge. Sorry, sorry Ayla, I just want to tell Josh that tiny piece that you just communicated is is a giant in this room of a million comments. That. Uh, desire to become aware, that desire to, to hear that feedback and to think about it differently, that's the magic that propels actual change. And the more people that hear this message, the more people that, that strip themselves of the burdens of traditional hiring um, are going to embrace this in a great way. And they're going to see confident, excited, and loyal workforce come to, to, come to fruition. 
Thanks, Monty. And and George, I, I know you've you've been chomping at the bit to get some some input in. So I, I uh, please take take the floor, sir. Oh, good afternoon. Oh, it's afternoon. Yeah. No, it's still morning. Um, George McNeely, I'm the CHRO for Shared Services at the State of Arizona. Um, I oversee uh, in HR for about 90 of the agencies. And I think uh, Monty hit on some key things there. Um, he's right on track as far as uh, questioning, you know, can we be virtual in a lot of these positions? You know, the state of Arizona does on every payroll period, every two weeks or so, we have between 14 and 16,000 people working remotely, you know, and that was a quick shift. Some, many of those positions cannot go, you know, they're forward facing, their licensing positions, their law enforcement, but that might mean questioning it, uh, investing in technologies that allow that to happen. You know, there's a lot of things you can do. And we've seen uh, in many positions, we've seen an increase in productivity up to 20%. You know, that's, that's an estimate with my team. I've seen it directly. Um, and as we've been very successful with that, you know, so Going virtual, it does help with some of the child care issues. These are child care issues that the rest of the workforce faces as well. It's not just veterans or mill spouses. It's the entire workforce is facing this through COVID. Um, just my background, yes, I, I'm a Marine veteran. I'm in HR. And there is a huge gap between the awareness from the veteran side and the employer side. And bridging that gap, you know, I think that's the biggest thing I'm taking away today is how critical that we've been talking about warm handshakes lately making sure that someone knows each other and and, and then knows the story behind and it's up to those employers to uh one educate their recruiters their hiring managers their leadership because it starts at the top right the leadership has to be willing to look at what it's going to take to staff their their positions and also to, to find those candidate pools those viable candidate pools which mill spouses vet spouses however you'd like to call it they do struggle to market themselves Sometimes I see resumes and it's clear that the, the, it, this might be a military spouse, but it's never kind of called out on a resume. And why not? You know, the average normal person, non-veteran only works three to five years at a position. A deployment, you know, you might move every three to five years, right? So it's normal to leave a job every three to five years. You're going to have gaps to take care of children, uh, to take care of uh, a parent. So it's not as different as the rest of the candidate pool out there. You know, we see 20,000 applications a month at the state of Arizona. How does a veteran stand out? Well, it's one awareness, knowing that there's some great skill sets that we want to go attract. Uh, we want to attract, retain, hire um, the leadership, the intangibles, right? The, the, the motivation. But I throw it back on the veterans and the mill spouses as well. They have to come and compete for that job. They have to be tenacious. And, you know, speaking only for the state of Arizona, I know there's other employers on here, but a high performer is going to uh, might might have to come in and take a job that is not necessarily the job they want, but they're going to move move up quickly because they are a high performer. You can be competitive in the state of Arizona. Right now, we have 800 vacancies, 1,700 different types of jobs available. Leadership jobs, all the way from a highway operations worker to uh, an executive director of a board or commission. So, tons of opportunities. It's just you know taking the tenacity you had in the military transition into the civilian world or keeping your foot in both. You know, I've, I, I just hired a national guard member in December uh, for my shared services coordinator. And she is an amazing employee. She works and then she goes on drill, you know, and she plants and she's got another 15, 20 years in the military uh, and she's going to do both. So um, Monty, I, I really appreciate your, your input and, and, and your your enthusiasm with 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 your opinions, I think you're right on on many of those. Um, and I think this is really worthy uh, meeting to have. And, and I love this the the comments that are coming in. So um, happy to shut up now. But that was in my soapbox, real quick. So thank you. I really appreciate that, George. Um, yeah, the the state the the transition to remote was a, a very painful for a, a lot of people and that that's it's 14 to 16,000 uh you said pay paycheck to pay pay period to pay period is where we currently are yes sir yep that's a, that's a significant piece of the pie for sure definitely and sometimes so, sometimes it comes down to like the old school mentality i'll give you an example when i was working at the top office it was like in the midst or at the beginning right like i went through covid and I was a tap and tap was um, 
one of the an essential building. So it didn't close throughout COVID, right? We had to stay open. But then we had those like the the you know the restrictions were coming into place. There was a lot of um, it was COVID was spreading. So we were trying to figure out like ways to really um, separate ourselves from the team, right? So a week on, week off, and things like that. And COVID definitely taught us that it was possible. But then one of the barriers that we had was the fact that this this commanders, the 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 generals, the you know the the chain of command was having issues, or well, not issues, but they they really wanted to make sure that our old school veterans also felt engaged, right? So they they all said that it was because the the the, the military, the service members really wanted in person assistance, which it was fine. But the funny thing is that most people actually wanted to go with the virtual uh, way of doing things. So it was possible. We were able to do it. And we rarely saw people in the office, but they still didn't want to close. They still wanted to stay open because it was an essential building, which is understandable. It is essential. People were getting still getting out of the military and all of those things. But it's just that old school mentality that you don't want to break barriers. You don't want to, you don't want to, make any change or any drastic change that is going to affect that that work culture at that moment, I guess. That's really insightful, Sonia. There's a ton of great feedback on this board and we only have a couple minutes left before we are out of time. So um, uh, first, I'd like to thank everybody who, who came and participated today. Um, we're going to take all of this, as I mentioned, um, get it into a rep reportable format and figure out uh, what we can action and start moving on. So um, first, thank you to Ayla, a Sonia, Monty, um, and George, you as well. I appreciate the insight. Um, if, uh, is, there anything, is there any other key, key topics that you guys want to hit on before we end today? Monty, if you can go ahead and, and just do, yeah, Monty, do your wrap up um, that you're really well known for Mill Spouse Mondays on LinkedIn um, and definitely uh, stay tuned to those Mill Spouse Mondays on LinkedIn. But Monty, take it away. Yeah, I will be super short and sweet. And that's for everybody on this call. I don't know what the numbers are. There was 31 last I looked. Um, make some noise, whether it is through your uh, veteran lens, your service member lens, whether it's through your military spouse lens, whether it's through the legislative lens, or whether it's through the industry and the employers, make some noise, understand this community, understand the challenges, and really embrace the fact that this can bring a return on your investment if you invest in this community. Um, Ayla, Sonia, Josh, and everybody on here, the fact that you're even listening to this for an hour long shows that we have a lot of work to do because this won't be enough. So I just encourage everybody whatever lane you're in and those areas of responsibility to go do something every single week to make a little bit of noise in that, to make a difference. And Ayla, Sonia, thank you so much for, for letting me even come in here and, and spout my nonsense at you. Thanks so much, Mani. And, and thanks everyone who attended. Um, the, a quick comment in the chat that's worth mentioning. Um, if you'd like to include your LinkedIn information and post it in the chat, it looks like um, we're trying to build a bit of a network here to continue the conversation. So feel free to do that before you end up leaving the room. Again, thank you everyone for so, so much for participating uh, and uh, hope you enjoyed.